Hello, I'm Martin and I'm a crocodile wrestler, which is what it feels like being the father of twins under three. When I'm not wrestling crocodiles, I'm a pitch coach and I help you enjoy the spotlight because you're telling stories which engage your audience. Yeah, I like that. You've been, that's fantastic. I'm Jimmy. I'm Jimmy Cannon. I am a voice um, and <laughs> I'm a voice coach and public speaking coach. And I help people through the power of their voice to nurture confidence, to produce better presentations and all that stuff. <laughs> and what's your website, Jimmy? My website is jimmycannon.com. And yours, Martin? Mine is 8secondstoconnect.com. Great. And Fantastic. Where where should people find you online, Jimmy? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, Jimmy Cannon Voice Coach on LinkedIn. And that's about I'm just on LinkedIn. That's it. Hundred percent. I am only on LinkedIn and I am Martin Barnes Crocodile Wrestler. Uh I, I, um there's something <laughs> I wanted to ask you. Um, um can you help me with this? You know, I tell yes, well, I can. And the thing is the the interesting thing is is that the first thing you've got to do is well from my perspective is to be is to be aware that you're doing it and I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a friend of mine who I said you know he said what are you doing I said well actually I'm doing quite a lot of videos I'm doing a lot of recording on on video and he said well listen I hope you don't mind don't take this too personally but you know you're I'm a, I'm a friend of yours and I, I want to just you know be honest with you and say if you're going to be doing videos, you've got to stop arming and ahhing because you do it all the time. When we're speaking, you're constantly arming and ahhing. And I just wasn't aware of it. And I looked back at some of my recordings that I did. And uh, I, uh, just like that, I was, um, you know, doing this all the time. And I think, actually, I really wasn't that aware of it. At least I might have been subconsciously, but I, I didn't think it was that, that a problem, much of a problem. But when I look back... It was quite significant. 100%. No. We don't know we're doing it, do we? No. And yeah. in, a, in a natural conversation, you, you're allowed to do it to a small degree. Yeah. Uh, but when you're presenting or pitching, it's, it's not appropriate behavior. It's not the right, uh, the right way to perform. No. Why, why, do, why do you think that is? What, what is it about it? I mean, I, we, we know, but it's interesting to sort of, you know, you know, nitpick it apart a little bit. What, 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 um, why do you think that is? For, from your point of view, your, your perspective, I know from a performance perspective why that's in, that's important, but and I suppose it's, we're, we're, you know, we're crossing lines here, aren't we? We're, you know, so go ahead. <clears throat> I would say from my perspective, it's down to preparation yep. and confidence. So I don't know the science behind it. I don't know if you've sort of researched into it um, through sort of any of your work, but mm. to me, those ums and ahs are just our brain giving us a fraction of a second of extra margin to think about what we want to say. Yeah. And if you're having a kind of very present conversation with somebody, you're allowed them because you're in the flow of a spontaneous uh, dialogue. Whereas if you're pitching and you're presenting and you have your audience and you have their non-refundable time, mm. you come in full of ums and ahs, and the audience is kind of going, how prepared are you? Yeah. And they're like, well, this is my time that I don't get back. And if yeah. you're full of ums and ahs, that means you haven't taken this moment seriously, so why should I? Yeah. So I think that's the danger. Um, I haven't ever looked into the science or the medical uh, observation of it. I don't have you. Um, um... Uh, <laughs> this gets very meta, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Not really. No, I've. I, I know that there. You there can be with the voice. There can be dysphonias. So there can be muscle dysphonias that are a somatic response or physiological response to anxiety. So that's that's something. So it might be the narrowing of the vocal tracts or the larynx or the throat. It might be, it might be that, you know, that, there might sorry. be a stamp. Sorry. Is that the equivalent of clenching your fists when you yeah. get frustrated or, or stressed? Y yes, exactly. But it, it's a somatic thing. You're not necessarily, you're not, you're, you'll feel it, but you won't notice it. It won't be, a, it won't be a behavior. It won't be a behavioral thing. It won't be something that you can physically notice. Or at least the other person won't be able to notice. But what that does is it causes the, it causes you to, 
to to stammer or stop or um to do this um you know or, and that can be but that's to do with more of a clinical reason and um, but you know these are all linked and somatic responses are linked to these sort of clinical or psychological uh, yeah go ahead what is a somatic response please so a somatic response is a physical response to a cognitive um thought okay, so it's cool. It's um, so okay. I'll give an example because I did. I I I'm, I studied it in my MA when I when I started doing it, which was globus pharyngeus is the lump in the throat. So you um, it's quite common to have a lump in the throat if you're a bit if you're nervous. You've got a dry throat. It's like, uh, that. It's a somatic response. It's a physiological response to being nervous, to being anxious about about whatever it might be. So that so when we have these ticks or these uh what i'm doing now we're we're kind of guarding ourselves it's a fight flight response in a way yeah and we've got to ask, yeah. yeah and we're guarding ourselves you know for ridicule against ridicule or etc and you know what i and going back to your point of being prepared when i started looking you know we're having a spontaneous conversation now i you know we we yeah. we, we know what we're going to talk about but we've no this is we haven't rehearsed this <laughs> i perhaps in hindsight wish we had <laughs> no it's fine no come on let's get let's do it let's go no, this is good you know going back to your your observation about present you know being prepared for the presentation it's exactly the same looking back at my videos i realized that you know the re the main reason that i'm umming and you know ring and umming is be, you know because I'm not I wasn't prepared and I wasn't I'm actually you know like I'm doing now I'm 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 on the fly I'm just talking on the fly and I thought I could do that I thought that would be fine it'd be fine I know what I'm talking about but it looks terrible it looks really really terrible and okay it's okay to um and ah a couple of times but people do it a lot exactly you know I think it's actually um, incredibly valuable when you're having an in-depth conversation. Because again, to me, it sends signals to your audience that you're actually really thinking about this, that you're not just delivering a line you've said a hundred times, you're not just coming up with a canned response, but you're actually like, hmm, let me, you know, let me think about that. You're, you're, hmm. you're slowing down, you're processing your thoughts and you're trying to articulate and send a message as clearly as you possibly can. So those little ums and ahs are, are quite appropriate in that moment, I believe mm. in a conversation or yep. a thoughtful response. Mm -hmm. But if you're sort of on stage or on camera and you're trying to deliver something, say in a two minute pitch, a six minute pitch, a 12 minute pitch, a 20 minute pitch, and you're full of ums and ahs, it's a bit like coming in with your shirt untucked or your hair not done or your shoelaces undone. It's just a bit, it's scruffy presenting. And I agree. I that the audience would sort of go, why, why am I listening to you? I could be doing a hundred other things. Yes, yes, I agree absolutely, and it 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 does it does tell that you're you're just not prepared, you're not planned, and and because if you're going um yes, so you know you, you you're looking at the next bit, and that's it's a way, and actually the simple the simple thing to do if you can't remember what your next you know your next topic is or your next sentence or excerpt is or whatever you know whatever you're you're speaking about, you can just take a breath and take this is something that I you know use in my in my my coaching is, is just to very very simply take a breath in through the nose and and you know this Martin but it's uh it's a very yeah exactly just like that and it doesn't take very long and it, the, the interesting thing is and I do this with my clients let, let's just take let's say something and then we're at the appropriate moment we're going to take a take a breath and I want you to take a breath I'll give an example I want you to take a breath as if you were taking, if you were smelling a flower. So, you know, if you imagine this pen was a flower and we were to take a breath and it would be about that much sort of time. It's not a lot. It's just enough to get the senses working. And that's going to give you time to plan what you're going to say next. Also, the other thing is, and I've said this many times, but also the other thing is that the, you want your audience to digest what you've just said. And you know, give them, give them a chance, the benefit of the doubt, to, to, to digest the information that you've just said, and and give them a chance to sort of analyze, you know, you know how what the what the tenet of the conversation is, or, or what the purpose of the topic is, etc. You know, hundred percent. That's I mean, that's really nice. What I was thinking as you were describing that is, 
an um and an ah is a very visible pause for your own thinking. Whereas what you just described, smelling a flower, is almost a disguised pause. Yes. We're all allowed to breathe. We're all allowed to sort of take a moment. But if you fill that moment with ah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake. Whereas if you breathe in through yep. the nose and then come back in and that, that breath will just give you time to settle your thoughts, think about what you want to say and then sort of move into the next phase. That's yeah, that's really nice. I hadn't thought about it like that. Absolutely, and and the the other thing about taking a breath in is that if you do it quite deeply, I don't want to go to start talking a lot about breathing now. But you know, if you if you really start, you know, using the abdominal muscles and contracting the diaphragm, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and taking a deep breath, you'll 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 if you if you do it properly, you'll release endorphins, which will will it's it's the happy drug, and you'll just relax, you'll balance yourself, you'll center yourself, and you'll be ready to say. The next topic with with ease and with confidence and that's it really really works excellent so what when yeah. you're working with people about mm. their voice and their breath and their confidence and their presentation so if you notice the the ums the ahs the ers what's your like first few tips if we get back into breathing that's fine because i think breathing is is such a core mm. skill that everyone forgets because they get anxious and it's like it's what we do naturally it's free yeah. We could all do it. It's it's just I, I think it's really important to very highlight the fact that breathing is such a key uh, skill to a, yep. to a great presentation. So how do you how do you help people get that breathing routine? Well, I I think okay. So I I I work with we the, what I my main focus when I'm when I'm coaching is the flow. So. I add things, so you know. So, for instance, how you there's quite a lot here to dissect, but which is, which is fine. Um, how you start a a word, whether it's now these are called onsets. So you've got three types of onsets. You have a hard onset or a glottal onset, which is if you were to say the word apple or echo, yeah. And that's so it starts with your do it for me now, Martin. Apple, apple, yeah. Now, if you were to say happy, say that for me. Happy. Yeah. Now say that's it like you, or say it like I would say, say it like no, say it like me. Well, I'd be interested to know how you say it, but say it like me as you know as well. For, firstly, so if let's just go back. So apple is a hard onset or a glottal onset. Now the glottal is the a little bit of skin under the underneath the vocal folds that opens up when air is passed over, and you can control the onset. It's that it's the attack of the sound. So I work when I'm working, particularly with people that stutter. The idea is that you try to use a, a, an aspirate or a breathy onset to start the word. So the normally the arming and ahring is a is a is a is a barrier. It's a like like a stutter. It's it's a stutter, a form of stuttering, and it's it's a barrier. It's a way to block your uh, block your anxiety or block your uh, lack of confidence to speak or your block block your um what i'm doing now is to block your train of thought if you haven't got anything to say so rather than uh do that i i get them to breathe through the phrase so we just keep breathing. So the, the firstly, the beginning of the phrase is really important, but the end of the phrase, as we're speaking, just to keep going, keep keep breathing, keep breathing, keep going, and just to just to let all the air out and control the breath, control the air from the from the onset and also the outset as well. So and that's I mean it you know it takes a bit of time to sort of get that, and there's there's sentences and phrases that we use to to try that with certain vowel sounds, etc. So it's uh, the onset's really important and the outset is something and a lot of it if you are umming and ahhing a lot it's because you've you stop the breath yeah so the breath is at you know if i um it's stopped right so there's a block there now if we keep the breath going if we keep the everything open here and we just and we relax and we let, let the belly drop and let the diaphragm contract come down and we use the breath and we keep it flowing yeah we're we're, we're more relaxed we're letting the air do the job. It's more in flow and we can just take more time to, and you, you do this. You have a very, very good pace when you, when you speak. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's definitely 
it's definitely managed, you know, it's de it, would you say? And you're, you're aware of that, I know. So when, when you're pitching. So just, in fact, just tell me about that. Tell me about how, you're, how you've worked on that. Because I know you've worked on that. I, we haven't talked about it, but I know that you've yeah, worked yeah, on it. So, yeah, yeah. so what, what is it you, how, how, have you, how have you become aware that you've had to, to manage that, your, your pace? Um, by just getting it wrong all the time. And it's something that I feel that I've got more awareness and um, skill with recently. Yeah. So my background is graphic design. And so I kind of came into pitching and presenting by making slides. And then once I'd done loads of making slides for other people, I started to then take the spotlight and be the person delivering the presentations. Yeah. And of course, I never used to warm up. I never used to practice. I never used to get in the right mindset. I was always on my phone just beforehand because I was nervous. And then you sort of spring in to mm. the moment. And it took me a while to realize that I was warming up in front of my audience, mm. which is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Because you're tripping up and stumbling and you're, it's like coming in late to a meeting and trying to get everything connected. You're just, it just looks terrible. Mm. So I got really conscious of just having like, a five to 10 minute window before a pitch or a presentation just to make sure everything was all right. Yeah. So focus the laptop, focus the technology, get that set up and then start focusing on my mind, do some breathing exercises. Mm. But again, I would still hadn't completely mastered it and I haven't mastered it, but I'm on the way to getting more control. And so I would sort of get myself ready but then I would just explode into the pitch, talk really quickly and just want to get about it mm. because I felt that would make it. And it's just like, what are you doing? Mm. Mm. And I'd say it's just in the last six months by kind of really getting to know a lot more other presentation coaches and consultants and listening to their content because we're all learning from each other. Mm. One of my biggest takeaways was just to slow it down. Yeah. And to speak and then stop. Mm. And that gives you that chance to smell the flower to mm. breathe, to take a sip of water. And then again, like, as you mentioned, your audience is then just taking, and everything that you've said is like sifting down like sand in water yeah. and settling and making sense. Because if you just go a mile a minute, mm. people just start to go, ah, oh, this is really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And they start to lean back. Yeah, yeah. And then when you can add a pause, you get that moment for leaning forward. Mm. And then people are getting more engagement and more, they're using more of their attention to listen to what you're saying rather than just using their time to sit in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a few ways that you can use. We, we're digressing slightly, but I think it's all, I mean, everything is linked to, you know, to pitching and presenting and, and just delivering with, with you know, with, with being more effective when you're delivering, I think, and engaging with the audience, which is really, really important. And just to go back to what you're saying, obviously, it doesn't necessarily have to be I mean, you know, if you're slowing down, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that everything is at the same pace and at the same volume and at the same pitch. You know, you can still have areas of excitement when you need it. But then when you need to make a point, you can slow down and, you know, stop, as you said, which I think is really, really important. Actually, stopping is really hard to do because there's that obligation to or guilt in a way you know that you have to you know you've been paid or to speak or you you know whatever the situation but you you know you're presenting it's your pitch it's your content it's very important to you you know you're absolutely you've got a lot of you know you a lot of you know weight on this it's really you know it's if you're pitching you're pitching i presume you know i know you work with startups so you're pitching to you know really important people that might that have the capacity to change your life so it's a, it's very very important, and you, that that obligation or that feeling of of guilt in a way to to keep going as I'm doing now, <laughs> you know, as an example, and not just and not stop, just for a few seconds is is really compelling, and I think that's a detrimental thing to the effectiveness of of of, of the pitch. I wasn't going to talk about I was going to talk about the talk about pauses because actually, the you can use a pause in a different in, in various ways so the pausing and taking a breath in just to diet you know to, to give you a chance to think about what the next uh topic is or what the next areas you want to speak about also for for people to digest the information but you can also use the pause to uh to to exasperate uh an uh a an emotion for instance so that sort of 
that sort of breath in, for instance, I'm not off the top of my head, but taking taking a breath in really makes kind of makes a point, doesn't it? You know, uh, you can do that. You can take a breath in and that 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 that's going to that's an exclamation mark. That's going to make a make a, you, you know that suddenly, as you said, people, they might they might be sitting back, but they might just sit up slightly, even, you know, even subconsciously. They might just, oh, what's he going to say? You know, so if I if I did this, you know, and and also that's that's it, again, it's to do with the onset here as well. And the voice just to go back to the voice a little bit. If you're if you want to practice the hard or the soft onset, then if if you're if I interrupt you, which which quite luckily you're not interrupt, interrupting, interrupting me now, which you should be, um, is I can I can just make a point and go like that. I've taken a breath in. I'm also creating a hard onset. I'm just about to say the, say the word apple. So I'll, let, me, let me give an example. So if I was to say something, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, apple, and it just makes it just gives you a little bit of anticipation before the actual phrase that you're going to say. So think about that: taking a breath in as a gasp, as an exclamation, and then starting it with the with a hard onset, and that will give you a little bit of space, a little bit of time, and it just so there's there's quite a few ways that you can use that pause, use that breath to create different different dynamics within your presentation. 100%, I agree. Mm. And you've just reminded me of an experience which I think would really um, be worth sharing. Mm. And I 100% agree, it's not about talking slowly, mm. but it's about pacing. Mm. And it's being having the range to, to sort of speak quietly and softly to, to, to create uh, a moment and then accelerate into another train of thought. And the best thing that I could, uh, would I, I would share with people, what I am going to share with people in the future, is um, so I read with my children. I have, I, I'm a crocodile wrestler, so I have two beautiful three-year-old twins, and it's like wrestling crocodiles. And we read loads of books together. And I think reading books to children mm. is an incredible way to start working on your performance. Because yes, you I love that. A very Mm. focused audience mm. that you care about mm, mm. so one one quick story about how we do it so when we were potty training so i had my two little girls on the potty we had to keep them sat there for a little bit to let them do their business so we'd read a lot of books and we had a nursery rhyme book and there was one particular nursery rhyme the grand old duke of york and so we'd read this one and for some reason i can't remember I just sort of went, and I think I was doing what you were just explaining with the onset and the offset. Mm. So I would open the book, they'd, they'd say, Daddy, 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 Grand Old Duke of York. So I'd find it, show them, and then I'd go, the Grand Old Duke of York. And I sort of raised some tension. They got yes. super, they had anticipation for the yep. moment. They weren't quite sure what was going to happen. They were fairly sure, but they weren't 100%. Yep. And that raise, and I and I performed, and I raised myself, and I looked up to the sky, and then I came down <laughs> yes, into yes, yes. the grand old Duke of York. Yes, yes, and yes. I went from, from from silence to speed, and it would send them into fits of giggles. And we spent <laughs> hours on the toilet, and I must have sang the grand old Duke of York a hundred yeah. times when they're yeah. on the potty. But your what you were describing from more of a performance technical aspect made me think of that story, and that might oh. be something that I think people would could find so easy to do is grab a book and either read it to your partner, husband mm. or wife, your best friend, mm. your children, mm. and just choose a passage and really, because you're not worrying about content, you're reading somebody else's content. So you're yes. actually really focused on your performance. Mm. Um, you know, maybe The Gruffalo by Julia Donaldson mm. is a super mm. great book. It's mm. so, um, so well written. Mm. Um, but yeah, just to do that to sort of, as you say, create a certain amount of suspense with the space with mm. the silence and then just drop into at whatever speed is appropriate the, the first lines because then your audience is on the edge and then they're with you and I think yeah. that's that worked really well for I love that I think that's absolutely fascinating I, I wondered if you I wonder if you could I suppose the problem I think it's a great idea and if you're if you're specifically reading a children's book I think you can you know it, it's just for that purpose for that technique to practice as well obviously you know and yeah, and I, there's no stress. There's no, no there's pressure ab about absolutely. delivering accurate information. You're just reading yep. a nursery rhyme or a story. Yes, definitely, definitely. And I think, um, I and I, I would even go further and 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 suggest that, although I'm 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 just thinking, you know, to use that technique of 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 delivering the the content in that way in that style, if you like, 
uh, would be really useful for, particularly for more academic writing, or as you said, in, uh, really, really sort of purpose-driven or information-based uh, content would be really interesting to deliver it like that i'd be that would be a great technique to do especially in a group workshop or something we should think about that you know absolutely yeah, yeah. no I, I was talking to somebody another mother who's got a online channel it's all about kids and reading and education and she also works with older children um she's chinese a chinese interpreter she speaks amazing english she's like a super high level interpreter mm. governments business that kind of stuff mm. and she works with sort of chinese uh 15 16 17 18 year old students who are living abroad studying in america the uk and they want to sort of really improve their english so she gets them to read the gruffalo which is mm. where i got the, the, the idea from mm. Oh, mm. i was like that is so good because I've read the yeah. Gruffalo a hundred times with the girls and even sometimes I get tongue-tied because yeah. I'm not 100% focused um, and it's such a uh, what is the right word a diverse use of language but mm. there's nothing complicated you could say each word on its own but the way that Julia Donaldson puts it together means you do have to sort of focus so to read kids books nursery rhymes limericks poems at, that are maybe written for children but have an adult uh, appeal because every every good children's book really does interest adults as well um, and to use that as a practice tool so you can uh, and i think it's really important to say i'm going to be intentionally practicing my performance right now and i'm not going to try and stack my message and my performance because mm -hmm. i'm going to worry too much about what i'm saying and i'm not going to yep. focus on what i'm actually performing so yeah, no, I think we should definitely, we should be telling everybody to read The Gruffalo by <laughs> to improve your presentation skills. Absolutely. I think it's great. Fantastic.